All right, I'm going to talk to you today about why debtors, people that are in debt, will take the mark of the beast. Okay, uh, many years ago with Bible Believers Fellowship, we had our house church a long time ago before I got married, um, I did a study called Gold and Silver, I think is what it was called. And in that I got into the thing of money, what is money and everything else. And I've had numerous requests over the years to redo that and um, been wanting to for a while. But um, one of my little side things that I like to study is uh, economics, um, stock market type of stuff and whatever else. Uh, that might surprise some people because, you know, kind of a dumb hillbilly in most people's eyes. But <laughs> I actually do like to study some of that stuff. I like to listen to a lot of the experts out there. I'll name some of them as we go throughout this study. But um, it's an area of interest to me because of the spiritual aspect of it. That's why I'm interested in it. Because the most significant uh, sin in the entire Bible is found in Revelation 13 and Revelation 14. And that is the mark of the beast. Anybody that has ever studied the Bible, even if you're just secular or whatever else, you know that the most serious, condemned, most condemned sin in the entire Bible is taking that mark of the beast. Okay, um, No man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. Revelation 13 talks about that. All right, Any man take the mark and worship the beast in his image, he gets the wrath of God. Revelation 14 talks about that. So it's very, very significant. And also very interesting because this King James Bible is the only English Bible in common usage today that says that the mark would be in the right hand, in the right hand or in the forehead. And for many, many years, commentators would say, I don't really know why they said in because it doesn't make sense. You can't buy anything with a mark in the right hand or in the forehead. That doesn't make any sense. So it obviously should, be, should have been translated as on. And most new versions will say on or upon. Um, but the King James Bible, translated in 1611, actually got it right. Because in would imply an implantable microchip. And people are doing that in a lot of other countries and things. And here in America as well. You can get the, some kind of a little biochip stuck into your hand or, or digital tattoo, QR code, whatever else kind of a deal. And it can be used to biometrically buy things. Biometric means you're combining a computer chip, some kind of a, a machine, with something biological, namely your flesh. Okay, just to make it very simple. There's a lot of very complicated things we're going to talk about in this study, but I'm going to try to keep it very simple. I'm going to try to explain it in what would be called layman's terms. Okay, and, I, and I'm by no means an expert, so I'm sure I'm probably going to say some things some people might disagree with or whatever. Okay, but I'm going to show you why I believe what, what was the purpose of creating this system of debt. Right? Obviously, when America was first founded, people would bring themselves over here and a few of their supplies, and then they're basically going to be um, making their wealth from the land. They're going to be surviving and, and struggling to survive. Um, the system of banking, modern system of banking, is only a few hundred years old. You go with the Federal Reserve Bank, it was 1918, I think, is the Federal Reserve Act was done. Um, and the Federal Reserve Bank is kind of funny, it's a joke. It's not federal, it's a private institution, and they have no reserves, okay? They're lying to you. They're printing money out of thin air. Again, we'll talk about that later. It's not real money, okay? And that's why when you look at the very first early editions of Federal Reserve notes, it actually says this note is redeemable in lawful money because the U.S. Constitution stipulates nothing but gold and silver coin is to be used in payment of debts both public and private. So America when it was founded, even George Washington I think said that the, a man that is, you know, has paper money is, is worse than a slave, something to that effect. When you can print money, then you have a real big problem. That's why all the countries right now are drowning in debt, because they've all given up gold and silver as a standard, which is the standard of, of money in the King James Bible, all throughout time, gold and silver coins. Okay, Again, we'll talk about that more as we continue. And all these countries start printing money. Printed money is fake. Again, we'll talk about that. But let's look at the scriptures here. Okay, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 in the King James Bible. All right. This is going to be a Bible study. 
This is going to be a lot of scripture. This is not a quick, interesting video with a bunch of fancy graphics and scary music and whatever else to, to emotionally really grip you and, and you can subscribe and whatever else. I don't care if you subscribe to my channel or not. I'm not monetized. I don't make money from my videos on YouTube. Uh, this video is to inform you. This is a teaching, Bible preaching and teaching ministry. I'm going to show you stuff from the economy today and how it relates to the King James Bible. right? And that's why I say get a King James Bible and look at it. Read it. I want you to see these things. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay? In context, it's talking about Satan. Unless you're a radical Calvinist like James White, who actually says the God of this world that's blinded the minds of them which believe not, he actually says it's God. Because, see, a Calvinist, again, just to educate you, to inform you if you don't understand this, a Calvinist teaches John Calvin back in the 16th century was a philosopher. He was not a saved man. He was a wicked pagan philosopher, called himself a Christian, but he wasn't. He philosophized that God has two groups of people, elect and non-elect. Elect people, God forces them to be saved against their will. They have no say in the matter. Unconditional election. Okay? The other group, the non-elect, they cannot get saved no matter what they do, no matter how often they call the Lord or whatever else, because they're non-elect. That's what John Calvin taught, to basically sum it up. There's the five points of Calvinism. The whole thing, you can look into it if you want to. But John Calvin, the philosopher, literally said that God would blind the minds of them which believe not. So you get to heaven and God says, depart from me, you cursed. Well, of course, you created me this way. I mean, it's pretty much insanity. Uh, God gave man a free will. You can see that all throughout the Bible, but another study. The passage is talking about Satan. Satan is the god of this world. Notice there in your King James Bible that it is a lowercase g. The verse, two verses above it there, to every man's conscience in the sight of God, capital G. Verse 6, for God, capital G. Down a little bit more, of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God, holy, completely God. Okay? But you'll see God is capital G. Again, look at the difference there. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world, it's lowercase g. It's not talking about God, the Father, okay? Jesus Christ. It's not talking about Him. They're one and the same being, by the way, the same person. Not two separate persons or three separate persons with the Holy Ghost. Please watch those studies as well if you don't understand the, the satanic nature of the Trinity. But here's the question, here's the point. How does Satan... The God of this world, how does he blind the minds of them which believe not? Okay? What is the trick that Satan uses to blind their minds? What is the most powerful, influential thing to most lost people? Let's look about that. Mark chapter 4. Go to Mark chapter 4 in your King James Bible. If you need to pause, if you're brand new to this whole thing and, and whatever else, and you say, uh, where's the book of Mark? What is that? Um, just pause the video, go to the very front, the table of contents, you know, and, and uh, just look it up and say, okay, where's the book of Mark? And go there to the book of Mark. Look at verse 4, cha or chapter 4, verse 14, excuse me. Um, take your time to look this stuff up. I know the world rushes on by and everything's just... Fast, 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 get this done, watch this, whatever else. But please just take some time and look up these scriptures. I'm going to show you why that's important. Mark chapter 4, verse 14. The sower soweth the word. That's me right now. Bible-believing, born-again preacher, and I am sowing the word. I'm preaching the word on a public platform, YouTube, for all the world to see. I'm not hiding behind anything in some little computer voice and they turn on your Bible. You know, no, no. My name is Brian Denlinger. I live in northern Maine. That's my real name and that's really where I live. I'm a preacher. I'm not hiding behind some special name or 
you know, whatever. That's my name. That's who I am. KingJamesVideoMinistries.com is the name of the ministry. Okay? I'm sowing the word to you. Here's the importance. Verse 15. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Uh, hello, YouTube. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm watching this guy and there's some really neat things. Oh, I should watch that video over there. Uh, 68 Camaro drag racing does uh, the quarter mile in less than 10 seconds. Well, here's one, uh, the goats climbing the side of a, of a rock cliff and, and amazing. And, and well, here's a funny video of a boy biting another boy's finger. And here's what's going on. I'm here trying to sow the word into your, into your heart to make you think about some things. And you get distracted by the world. And the devil comes along and he starts to blind your mind. You see? And he gets you fixated on all a bunch of other stuff. And all of a sudden you say, Oh yeah, what was that? I was gonna watch that video, but yeah, I got a bunch of other stuff to do. My friend just called me on the phone and or just texted me or whatever else. Shut all that stuff up. Okay, just stop all that stuff. Listen. Read along in the scriptures. This is more important than anything else. Verse 16. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Oh, this is really good, man. This really makes me think. And have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. A lot of people play Christian. You'll see that with these atheists. They'll say, I was raised a Christian. I went to church ever since the time I was a child. And then I went off to university and I learned the truth and blah, 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 blah. Um, the word sown into them and their little church building thing or whatever, the vacation Bible school, Sunday school, whatever. And they hear about Jesus. They hear about the Bible. And they might even see some verses of Scripture or whatever else, pretend that they're a Christian for a while. And then later on, they have no root, you see. And so later on, they fall away. They quit. Mm -hmm. You see, I'm going to tell you something a little shocking. You know who's behind the church building thing? If you're new, if you've never heard any of this stuff before, there's not one church building in this entire New Testament here. Old Testament, they had the temple, they had the sanctuary, the Jews, God was dealing with them as a nation. Sure, Levitical priesthood and all that other stuff. New Testament, not one person ever went to church. Did you know that? Nobody wears suits and ties. Sunday best. Nobody goes down front for the altar call. Nobody gives 10% of their tithe. All that stuff is far into Scripture. You know who created it? Satan. Why? So he could trap people. So people could come out of it, that whole wicked, corrupt system filled with all the hypocrites, and they could say, yeah, I used to do that stuff, but not anymore. I don't want anything to do with that stuff. Mm -hmm. Satan traps people with organized religion. This Bible teaches something completely different. You can watch our videos. we got plenty of them on there for free, on here for free. Please, study. Verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of the world, of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, entering in, choke the word, and becometh unfruitful. Now here's where it gets very interesting. Okay? The cares of this world. Let me write these out here, because this is very, very important. Satan has three ways to blind you. Satan's three-step plan, we'll call it. Number one, you have there the cares of this world. Cares of this world world. You say, what's that? Well, that would be your job and monthly bills. You say, well, we all have to do it. Are you saying it's satanic? And no, I didn't say it's satanic. But what happens is you'll get fixated on that stuff. It becomes your whole life. 
I don't have time to do anything else. I don't have time to read the Bible. I don't have time to get to know who God is or whatever else. I got the cares of this world. See what I mean? Number two, the deceitfulness of riches. Now it gets interesting. What is that? Fake money. And we'll just say credit. Ah, messed that up. Got ahead of myself there. CRD. <laughs> and credit. In other words, debt. Okay. Let me just demonstrate that very quickly here. Okay. Right here we have two frauds. Federal Reserve Accounting Unit Devices. All right. Now let me just make a point here. What is the difference between these two? It's the same exact size piece of paper. Close to about the same amount of ink. What makes this one worth $100 and this one worth $20? What's the difference? Well, what the Federal Reserve prints on them. Now, this isn't a very good example of worth because they're both actually pretty much junk, but here you have a quarter and you have a penny. What's the difference between the two? The quarter is bigger than the penny. The quarter is made out of different material than the penny. Did you know that up until, I think it was 1964, quarters were made out of silver? 90% silver, I think, 10% copper. Now it's a bunch of other junk metals and things. doesn't even matter. Did you know that up until 1982, pennies were made out of almost pure copper? Now it's zinc with a copper coating on it. You can take a pocket knife. This is a uh, 1985. So yeah, this is a newer penny. You can take a pocket knife and scratch it and you'll see the silver. Do that with an old penny and all you'll see is copper. You can take a, a bolt cutter and chop one of these in half and you'll see the silver. Take an old one, pre-1982, actually they switched in the year 1982. So some 1982 pennies are, are heavier if you weigh them on a gram scale. But this, if you cut it in half, pre-1982, it was copper. And nickels during the war were actually made out of silver for a little while. And they made pe uh, pennies out of steel because copper was so valuable because of the war. But you see, the whole point is metal like that, there's a difference, right? Now, I'm not going to hold up silver and gold here or anything, but you get silver and gold coins. Um, they're made out of metal. And gold is worth more than silver, okay? And here's the point. Gold and silver, there's a limited supply. So you can't have inflation in the sense of you can't have just, you know, unless they find a whole bunch more gold and silver and, and make more coins, you see, but there's a limited supply, which means no inflation or very little. Like I said, if you'd find some, technically you could make more coins, but uh, you're limited in how much money you can make. How about this? How much money can you make when you can print it? Well, the sky's the limit. Print as much as you want. What's it do to the economy? We'll talk to your grandparents. Hey, uh, Grandpa, what was gas? What was the cost of gas back when you were a teenager? Ten cents, fifteen cents, twenty cents, depending on how old you are. Hey, Brian, what was gas? The cost of gas back when you were a teenager, back in the 1990s, <laughs> uh, born in 1975. What what was the cost of gas? 85, 90 cents a gallon. Changed a little, hasn't it? You know why? They printed more money. And see what the devil does, one of the ways he blinds you is he gets you up here, the cares of this world. Got to have a job. Got to have these monthly bills I need to pay, which we'll talk about debt here later on. But boy, look at that money. Oh boy, deceitfulness of riches. People worship this stuff. They worship fake money. 
And how about those little plastic things called a credit card? Oh boy, even worse. Because you see this stuff here, you have to earn this. You know, you rob it from the bank or something, you're not earning it, but then you're going to jail because you did it. Uh, you have to earn this stuff though. You have to sell something or work for somebody, get your paycheck, go to the bank and get the funny money here. But credit, oh boy. Now we're dealing with something completely new because now you have a little card. I'm not gonna show one because I don't have one. But you take your little card and you say, I don't even have to wait for the fake money for my paycheck. I can take my card and I can go buy what I want right now. Hey, how about that? Um, do you think that the devil could use that to blind your eyes? Mm-hmm. Let me show you the next one. Cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and number three, the lusts of other things. How the devil gets you. Okay? Which the Bible calls covetousness. What is covetousness? I covet this thing. I want it. I don't need it, but I covet it. I want that thing. I, I just, oh, I just, oh, did you see that new motorcycle that they just came out with? Oh, man, that thing, oh, it's just so nice. I got to get one of those. Do you have enough money? Fake money? No, I'll buy it on credit. Um, boy, that house. Oh, man, did you see that new house that they, they, they they're building these new houses, this new development over here? Boy, those are, oh, those are such nice places. I was on Realtor.com and I saw this house. Oh, it's beautiful. My dream house. Do you have $200,000 in funny money or in gold and silver? <laughs> uh, well, no. I'm going to go to the bank. They're going to give it to me. And then I'll appear to be rich. Boy, I have a nice house. I have a nice car. Nice clothing. I go out to eat. I have a cell phone. I have all these different things. A large flat screen TV. You got to have that in your big house. I got all this stuff. Deceitfulness of riches. You look like you're rich, but you're a pauper. You're poor. You don't own that stuff. But you have lust of other things come in. What would happen if everybody was reduced to simply what they themselves had paid for? What would happen? Do you realize how many homeless people there would be that appear to be uh, rich right now? Yeah. And here's the sad part about it. The Bible talks about they that will be rich. We're going to be getting into that here in a minute. But the, the Jesus talked about, you know, how hardly shall they that trust in riches enter into the kingdom of God. You're trusting in your riches. And you can live, by the way, in a way. The Bible talks about making yourself poor so that you can have great you know, riches. I have a sermon on that. You can live very, very simply and cut down on your monthly bills. There's a whole lot of things that you can do. I'm not even going to get into them all here. But uh, you can work for yourself and cut out your monthly bills. Live a very, very nice life of freedom. Still have some things that you have to pay for, certainly. Not a problem. But you're not going to be uh, caring as much. You're not going to be all concerned and oh, how am I going to pay my bills this month? And oh, I hope I can make my payments. Your life is not going to be run by the cares of this world. And you're not going to be deceived by the deceitfulness of riches. I drive around these roads and I see people with their brand new trucks hauling a brand new big tra trailer with a whole bunch of snowmobiles in the thing coming up here to enjoy themselves. <laughs> Yeah, it gets a little time off of their job that they're a slave to. And I look at that and I say, it's deceitfulness of riches. There goes a debtor. There goes a slave driving by. I don't look at that and say, oh, I feel so poor. <laughs> I own what I drive. I own where I live. They don't. They're debtors. And I don't have lusts of other things. You say to me, hey, uh, would you like to have a brand new truck? No, thank you. 
Would you like to have a really big mansion someplace? No, thank you. Don't want it. Not interested. How about going on a luxury vacation to Paris <laughs> or to the Bahamas or something? No, thank you. Happy and content just to walk around my land out here. Snow, cold, love it. My snowshoes that are paid for, you know. You see? Why? Because I'm not part of Satan's three-step plan. I enter in here at the next one. Mark chapter 4, verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. Spiritual fruit. The Lord has helped me to bring that forth over the years, and I thank Him for that. I am honored to be used of the Lord. But uh, it doesn't lead to this life here. When you're used, truly used of the Lord, you're not going to end up as a Kenneth Copeland or some other Benny Hinn or charismaniac nut that's all about money and getting people's money. 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is a very important passage of Scripture. Now, I'm going to give you the solution, too, by the way, for the thing of if you're in debt. How you can get out of that whole thing and out of that mess. I am reporting on a problem today, but I'm going to give you solutions. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You want one of the first things that you can do to really, you know, make your life better? Godliness. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay? Are you concerned with godliness in your life? You should be. How about contentment? Or do you struggle with covetousness? Do you have to have the latest and greatest and the best of everything and whatever else? A little problem with covetousness there. Covetousness there. Okay? Learn to be content. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The old saying, uh, pick some rich person and say, how much did he leave behind? Wealth-wise, you say, oh boy, I'd have to look at a statistics. No, you don't really need to. He left everything behind. Was, how many millions? Doesn't matter. How many billions? Doesn't matter. He left it all behind. Somebody else got it. Hmm. We'll see about that here in a little bit. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Are you content with just your food and clothing? But check this out. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. They that will be rich. Are you rich when you get into this? Fake money and credit? No. You're trying to have the illusion of riches so that the lusts of other things can become manifested in your life. You can just buy and buy and buy and buy. And I think we ought to get a boat this year and I think we ought to get the new vehicle and I think we should get a bigger house and we ought to... Lusts of other things. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. You see? And here's one of the key verses of Scripture that you need to memorize. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You say, wait a second. Erred from the faith is lost people erring from the faith? No, it's talking about saved people. Saved people can get just as messed up as lost people when you start letting the devil rule your life. And you start coming in and you get all concerned about the cares of this world. And then you get into the fake money and credit, the deceitfulness of riches. And you start to lust after other things. The devil can clean your clock as a Christian when you get yourself into the big system of debt and everything else. And you got to have everything and look just like the lost world. It's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, there's people out there that like to live debt-free. And they're not Christians. They'll follow the Word of God before a Christian will. That's a problem. <laughs> but what should you do as a Christian? But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Flee. Run away. 
Don't dabble in them. Flee. Get out of debt. Okay? And getting out of debt doesn't mean, well, I should win the lottery or something, then I can pay my debts off, and then I'll be out of debt. It doesn't work that way. It means you get rid of things. You scale down. Start to look at the past and realize, you know what? How many things am I doing and, and practicing in my life that people even 100 years didn't do? But I have to have these things in order to survive? Think about it. And follow after righteousness. Godliness, there it is again. Faith, love, patience, meekness. Hmm. Very interesting. But again, what do we have? They that will be rich. People that get themselves into debt. They fall into Satan's plan. They are blinded by that stuff. You say, well, you know, I, I think I can do both, though. I think I can do both. You know, we all have to have debt. We all have to have big mortgage houses and brand new vehicles and things. I mean, everybody else does it. I don't see it as a problem. I have to make money, you know, a, a big part of my life. I have to stay in the city because the money's better here. I have, to, I have to make more money to make my life more comfortable. I can't go live some primitive life out in the woods someplace. I, I just don't feel called to do that. Okay, here's a verse for you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. The highest paying jobs in this land require you to keep your mouth shut as a Bible believer. Don't tell me any different. I get so sick and tired of hearing this. Why well, have this big high paying job and things? And we have prayer study. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go to your job and start ripping on the Catholic Church. Go to your job and start saying things, and or more so, you know, make a YouTube channel and start coming out and preaching hard and everything else, and all of a sudden you're going to get that little call into the office here. And, yeah, um, we found out some some of the, the videos that you're doing, and we don't really feel that that best represents our client, you know, company, and, and we're kind of worried about what our clientele might think about that, you know? We're just, we're just, you know, maybe we don't want to have you monetized. And, 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 you know, some of your superiors are just kind of saying, hey, I think you really need to tone this down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't serve God and, mon and mammon. Money is what mammon means there. Don't give me this stuff. Well, well brother, I, I, you know, I used to hand out gospel tracts when I'd go out and I'd do tree work or I'd do whatever other kind. And then I didn't get callbacks. So I, I just kind of quit witnessing on the job and I, you know, kind of, I, I, got, I got a family to provide for. I can't, I can't do this preaching stuff and turning people up. God can't provide for you? Well, yeah, yeah, I think he could, but just not on the level that I want. Know what I mean? And, oh, but, but brother, I have to stay in the system. The system is failing. If you study the economy, the system is falling apart right now. This whole fake system, the whole system of debt and everything else, the stock market's just blah, 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 just going crazy. But you're selling your soul to get that stuff? To get the for, good 401k and to get the good investments and to get the good return on your, uh, yeah. Brother, I, I have to stay here, in the, and i, I got to be in there in this area. Yeah, I've heard that thing so many times. I'd love to be able to move off grid, but we just can't. We just can't. I, I can't afford to leave the city. <laughs> okay, well, compare the cost of city houses compared to the cost of land out in the middle of nowhere. Or country, people, places out in the country, little towns and whatever else. Don't tell me you can't afford to move out to a country area. Give me a break. You don't want to give up your life that you have. You're serving mammon, and you hold to mammon, and you don't want to get let go of mammon, and you don't want to trust the Lord and live by faith. Mammon's going to be ripped out of your hands very soon. You can hate me. You can hate the messenger. You can attack me. You can say, well, you just have no grace. You just have no, you're, you're just so mean-spirited. It's going to be ripped away from you soon. I'm trying to warn you. 
like a prophet in the Old Testament. I'm yelling and saying, flee from the wrath to come. It's going to fall. It's going to break apart. No nation has ever done these things before. $23 trillion plus dollars of admitted debt. You can't get away with this. America is falling. You say, well, I'll go to Germany. Germany is falling. Well, I'll go to China. China is falling. All the countries are failing right now. Why? Well, because the Bible says that there'd be a mark of the beast in the end times. So all the economies have to fall apart. You say, well, well brother, we're going to be caught up soon. I don't know when the rapture is going to happen, when the resurrection is going to happen. That's the better term for it. I don't know when it's going to happen. We might go through some bad times. Christians went through the Great Depression here in America back in the 1920s, not even 100 years ago. Some of you still have grandparents that were alive back then. Maybe some of you had parents that were still alive back then. Went through it. That remember how bad it was. And they were a lot stronger and more Bible-believing than we are today. What could God let us go through? Oh boy. People that were growing gardens, raising their own food. And here we are. Generation after generation raised up that the supermarket is our provider. Remember a story a guy used to work with, and he went and he, you know, they had these fresh air children. Got this little boy from New York City, lived, born and raised in New York City, and they brought him out. And they're going down the road. The guy lived out in the country, and he, and this little boy looked out the window, and he said, "What are they?" And they said, "What? What?" And he said, "Those things out there in that field." And they said, "They're cows." What do they do? He said, "Well, that's where we get milk from." And the boy just shocked. I never knew that. <laughs> Little boy. He thought, you know, milk comes from a jug at the grocery store. Didn't even know where milk came from. I mean, as a little boy, he'd have grown up and understood that milk you know, comes from cows or whatever. But the whole point is, um, do you know how to get milk from a cow? Do you know how to grow your own food? Do you know how to find your own food? Well, no, but we'll always have grocery stores and we'll tell that to the people back there in the Great Depression. You say doom and gloom. Uh, it's called warning. Proverbs chapter 8. Here's a good passage back in here. Proverbs chapter 8. Talk about uh, where you want to find real wealth. See, I'm, I'm going to be going through this whole study. We're going to be looking at problems, and we're also going to be looking at solutions. Where you should invest your money. Where you should invest your time. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 through 21. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places, by the way and the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in, at the doors. You know, i got to just pause here for a minute. There's going to be a lot of that in this study. Literally, we went up to the town of Presque Isle. I don't know, you can't really call it a city compared to New York or Los Angeles or something. Little town of Presque Isle. However many thousand residents or whatever, not that many people. But uh, there's a Burger King there. For years and years and years, we don't eat out, we don't eat at fast food places especially. But this thing's been there for years. Closed. What in the world? Went to our office in town and, and uh, my wife checked it out. There were three Burger Kings here in northern Maine. All three are closed. Why? Lack of sales. Well, see, if you don't have wisdom, you look at that and you say, well, okay, well, I think they'll probably come back because the economy is getting better and the stock market's doing good and this is the strongest economy ever because Donald Trump said so. And, you know, whatever. You're not wise. The wise look at that and they say, oh, boy. And as you're driving along and there's another place closed. That place is closing. The, the shopping mall over there, that barely has anybody even in it anymore. Houses aren't being repaired. And, oh, boy, God, give me wisdom. I want to know what's going on. The Lord says, uh, the economy's falling apart. Better control your spending. The money that you have, you better start thinking about a good way to invest that. You better get a little bit more self-sufficient. You see? 
wisdom, understanding, knowledge. Or you can just live in your little opium pipe dream and just keep thinking everything's going to get better. Let's continue. Verse 4. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. O ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be some PhD or whatever else to understand what's going on with the economy. Any fool can look and say, okay, there's a store that once was popular. Now the doors are shut. That's bad. That's a, a, a ominous sign of the economy collapsing. Hey, I remember years ago when gas was $1.50 a gallon for the cheap stuff, the regular. Now it's $3. That's a bad thing. Simple people can understand this. You don't have to be that bright. Verse 6, Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. You want to speak right things? Or tell some dirty jokes and whatever? I mean, aren't there more important things to talk about than some filthy show on television? Or some stupid movie or some wicked rap music or rock music or whatever else. Country music. Whatever the, the genre of music is. Maybe you should get a little bit serious about the, the direction that this country is headed. And the direction that the world economy is headed. Verse 8. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. A wise person, you'll, you'll hear it in their speech. They'll be more well-spoken. They'll be more serious. More concerned. I'm deeply concerned with what I'm seeing here. One of the economists that I like to watch, and I'm not recommending him as a fine Christian thing and sit down with your Christian family to watch. The guy's got a foul mouth. But I respect a lot of his views, and that is Gerald Salente. And one of his famous statements is, current events form future trends. If you see big chain stores, Kmart and Circuit City, they're, I guess, totally out now. Radio Shack, I think they're totally gone as well. Um, pay less shoes. Whatever. And they're shutting their doors. They're closing their doors. Those are current events. You're seeing them in your hometown. And what is it doing? It's forming future trends. More stores are shutting. Guess what that means? Even more in the future. People are getting into more debt. That's a current event. What does it mean? Future trend. More people will get into debt. More people will drown in debt. It's common sense. The man has street smarts. Okay, like I said, watch out for the, some of the language, but the guy knows what he's talking about when it comes to the economy. Spiritually, I wouldn't follow the guy across the street. But economically, he's got some stuff figured out. Verse nine, they are all plain to him that hath, or to him that, to him that understandeth. Excuse me, and write to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. Oh, you know, and Gerald Salente is a big proponent of, of silver and gold. But I'll tell you what, what's more important is uh, my instruction and knowledge rather than choice gold. Who's it talking about there? God. You better get to know God. You better get right with God. And the knowledge and, un and, and wisdom that He gives you is better than silver and gold. That's one of the big mistakes a lot of these guys make. They say, get into gold and silver. And gold and silver is Bible money. Okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to reject that or say it's not or whatever. Gold and silver are useless. They're not useless, but they will be in the future. Okay, That is biblical money. But Satan, with his system here, he is creating a system whereby he is going to phase out gold and silver. That's why gold was taken back around the Great Depression years. I forget the exact year, but gold was confiscated back then. Silver in 1964 and even copper in 1982 here in America. And you look at any other country. Canada did it. Uh, Mexico did it. I forget the years of, you know, like the UK and everything. They're all taking gold and silver. And ironically, there was a nation uh, that had worthless paper the Weimar Republic, Germany, post-World War I, and what happened? Adolf Hitler came to power, and you know what he did to get the economy back up? He started minting 
silver, gold and silver coins. And the Germans prospered. Hmm. They don't have them anymore, though. You can bring a country back with gold and silver, but that's not about to happen in the future. See, people look and they say, gold and silver, it's, it's been there for thousands of years. They're right. Gold and silver can't be messed around with, with inflation or whatever else. Can't be faked. They're right. I mean, China tries to fake it with, you know, making fake coins and stuff. I get that. But you get a, 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 somebody who's an expert looking at coins, they can, uh, this is fake silver or fake gold. But I'm saying real gold and silver, you can't make it. Okay? You can't print it up. It's real money. Very important. But what I'm saying to you is, I'm going to show you in the scriptures, the Bible prophesies a time when that gold and silver is going to be useless. That's important to understand here. And what do you need at that time? Well, uh, receive my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. That's what you need. God's instruction and His knowledge. Verse 11, For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. Do you ask God for wisdom? I do every day. Every time I pray, God, please give us wisdom. God, please give us wisdom. I'd rather have it than a bunch of jewels sitting around. Verse 12, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. You better hate that stuff too. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Seek knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Seek it early. You don't have to be old to figure that stuff out. Don't follow the course of this world here and get it trapped in Satan's three-step plan up here to blind your mind. Seek it early. You say, well, I'm a teenager. Seek it early. Okay? Make sure you seek it early. Let's continue here. Um, verse 18. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. So there you see it again. Wisdom is better than gold and silver. We'll get into that as we continue. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. Hmm. So you can actually have wisdom and understanding and knowledge, and it can actually fill your treasures, and you can actually have substance. Hmm. I wonder what that means. I'm going to show you as we continue with this whole thing. Proverbs chapter 22, you say, well, I can have all that stuff. I just have to go down to the bank and get out a good loan and, and uh, I'll, I'll be all right. You know, we'll be okay. Hey, if I refinance, I can refinance. And that way we can get a, a, a newer truck and we can get, you know, a newer house, a, a bigger thing. And, 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 and we, I could get dirt bikes for each of the children and four wheelers and, and we can get new Xboxes and, and big screen TVs and all we got to do is just refinance. Just go to the bank and they'll give me funny money. Well, they won't even give you funny money. They'll give you a number on paper. That's even better. But what happens to you? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. The rich ruleth over the poor. See, here's another thing. The devil also has people that serve him. And they work for him in the banking system. So those people get rich. False riches. They're not really rich. They're just you know, bigger, you know, they, they understand the scam of the whole debt thing. And so they'll get you into that. They'll trap you. And then they rule over you. How so? And the borrower is servant to the lender. Hey, I can't go on vacation right now. I can't do these things here. Why? I have to keep working at my job and I have all these monthly bills to pay. Or one of my favorites, I have to put my children through college. <laughs> okay. Colleges are going broke. And they're going to teach your child how to make money. Think about that one. Okay. Um, if you go and you get yourself into debt, you will be a servant to the lender, 
to the banker, in other words. That's how the, how the whole system works. Very important to, to not fall for that. But I'm going to show you the example of two very wealthy men in the Bible. Um, the first one is probably one of the wealthiest men that ever lived. Let me show you. In the book of Ecclesiastes, actually the man who God inspired to write the book of Proverbs was king. He was a king named Solomon. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you the kind of money that this guy had and the kind of power that he had. But first I'm going to show you what he thought about it. See, normally I'd go and show you the kind of money he had and then later what he thought, but I'm going to show you first what he thought about it. And he goes over some of the wealth here too. But let's read here, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. I had made me great works. I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kind of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens, and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold, see that here in a little bit, and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers, and the daughters of the sons of men, as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and, more, and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. He didn't go senile or crazy in the head like a lot of the Hollywood people do. And he had a whole lot more. You look at all that stuff there? He had a whole lot more. I mean, how many, how many big celebrities or how many big bankers or whatever else can say that they have men servants and maid servants? Some. How about women singers and men singers? And physical gold and silver and peculiar treasure of kings. We're going to look about some of that gold that he had here in just a little bit. Verse 10, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was the portion of all my labor. Can any of you out there say that whatever you want, you get? Even in this system, you can't, it's not limitless. You can't just go and just borrow and borrow and borrow and borrow. There's a limit to the credit that the bank will give you. Okay? They'll reward you for being a creditor, for being a debt in, indebted, uh, indebted slave to them. Uh, they'll reward you for being their little servant, but there's a limit. King Solomon said, no limit. Whatever he wanted, he got it. And what did he think about it? Verse 11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on all the labor that I labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. You'll see that. You'll see that with some of these wealthy people. They get to the end of their lives and they say, so what's it like to succeed? And they just say, I don't know. I really don't think I even know anything. I, I just think I've kind of wasted my life. And, and you, you'll see that type of thing. Some of them blow their brains out because they get to the top of the ladder of success and they realize there's nothing up here. <laughs> okay, I'm still the same guy. It's just I got more trouble and more whatever else. I heard years ago, I think it was Steven Spielberg lives in a house that he has to take a helicopter to get into it. Guard towers around the thing and, you know, whatever else, you can't even get into the thing. Oh, that sounds like prison to me. See these celebrities and they're being stalked by people and whatever else and you can't go, you can't go to the grocery store without people, oh, are you so-and-so? Can I have your autograph? What a terrible life. That's why these people are just bombed out of their brains on drugs a lot of times doing you know, getting alcohol, just drunkards and whatever else. They got all kinds of problems. But that's good, right? No, it's vanity and vexation of spirit. And all they would have had to do is just read the Bible and see the greatest man that ever, the, the, one of the wealthiest, wisest men that ever lived, um, had a thousand women. Not one night stands, not prostitutes or hookers. Um, 700 wives, 300 concubines, I think if I have that right. A thousand women to choose from. Whatever he wanted it. 
wealth and riches and everything else that he mentioned there in that passage. What is it? Vanity and vexation of spirit? He got to the end of his life and he realized he was trapped. Satan got him. Lured him into his system. But let's look at something very interesting here. You want to look at gold and silver for all you gold and silver bugs out there? 1 Kings chapter 10. Say, well, you know, with the way the economy is going, I think that the only safe haven for your money is in gold and silver. Physical gold and silver. If you can't touch it, you don't own it. Uh, you got to have that physical gold and silver. You got to get that thing, hide it away someplace, put it in a ammo can and stick it inside some plastic thing and bury it out some way, have a hidden cache of gold and silver. Because when the economy goes, crashes, you're going to be able to dig that gold and silver up and buy whatever you want. They're manipulating the price right now, but they won't after the economy crashes. <laughs> uh, think. Think. I'm going to show you the... I will prophesize what's going to happen to that gold and silver that you're stashing away. I want to show you. But if you like the gold and silver thing, remember the guy that just said he had gold and silver. He said, what do you have, a couple ounces? Oh, a couple. <laughs> I'll show you 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14 through 21. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. Six, six, six. Hmm. We'll get back to that. Beside that he had of the merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants and of all the kings of Arabia and of the governors of the country. And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went to one target. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three pound of gold went to one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Uh, verse 18. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory little money there, and overlaid it with the best gold. <laughs> it's not, you know, good enough just to have it, you know, it's made out of ivory. Oh, let me just put gold over top of it yet, you know. <laughs> the throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round behind, and there were stays on either side on the place of the seat, and two lions stood beside the stays. And twelve lions stood there on the one side and on the other upon the six steps. There was not the like made in any kingdom, and it, and all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold. Drinking vessels. And all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. Look at this. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. King Solomon, here's a, you know, 12 troy ounce pure silver, you know, cup. Or 100 troy ounce pure silver cup. He'd say, oh, oh, Silver? Oh, uh, yeah, well, um, just throw it out. I don't know. Silver? I'm not interested in silver. You know, uh, just bring me some, you know, bring me my gold cup over there, okay? I need to take, you know, just a little bit of water here in the afternoon. You know, pure gold cup. How many celebrities or how many people can drink out of a pure gold cup? Maybe the Pope or something, but, you know, uh, not too many people have pure gold cups. Invite you in, you know, and stuff. Oh, you know, family get together and whatever else. Just bring out the gold, you know, cups and plates and silverware and everything, you know. Well, goldware, not really silverware. That's a little bit of money. But look at that number. 666 talents of gold there, verse 14. In one year, 600 shekels of, excuse me, uh, 603 score and six talents of gold. Now, what is a talent? Well, Webster's 1828 Dictionary says a talent is 56 pounds, approximately 56 pounds. I'm not going to fight over exact numbers here and whatever else. 56, okay? So 666 times 56 would be 37,296 pounds of gold in one year. That's a bunch. Nearly 14 tons of gold. Physical gold. In one year. Now, can you show me anybody? Warren Buffett. Uh, what's the Bill Gates thing? Uh, um, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the, some of the Italian families and what it... 
Do any of them make uh, 14 tons of gold in a year? Physical gold? No, I don't think so. You're not going to get your hands on 14 tons of gold. Solomon did. And he said it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. He didn't say, oh, man, I'm stocked up for the end time. doesn't matter what they do to the stock market. It doesn't matter about, you know, all the stuff with the economy. doesn't matter because I got 14 tons of gold in one year. Vanity and vexation of spirit. Hmm. But what's that worth? Okay. If you take 37,296 pounds times 16 ounces, because you go usually by ounces, a ounce of gold is worth however much. 16 ounces, ounces in a pound. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. That would give you 596,736 ounces of gold. I don't know what gold is right now because it's just up and down and up and down and up and down, but it's, I'll just uh, calculate it $1,200 an ounce. I think it's probably more closer to $1,500, but I forget the exact number. But we'll just go with $1,200. So you take that number of ounces times $1,200 per ounce, you would have $716,080,000. 7 million, excuse me, $716,083,200. Okay, let me say that again. $716,083,200 in one year, physical gold. Show me anybody that makes that today. Nobody. So, well, I know so-and-so and he made a billion dollars in one year. Fake money. Numbers on a computer. Somebody could just go and delete it. Oh, hey, we're going to transition over to this new system here, the Mark of the Beast. There it goes. Are you a debtor? Do you want to lose it all? Or are you willing to take this new mark in the right hand or the forehead? You want to continue the game, don't you? Well, I don't want to lose my mortgaged house and my... And my car loaned vehicles and, and all my other things and my vacation home in Hawaii and, 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 and I, I don't want to lose all that stuff. Then take the mark. Worship the beast and his image. Simple. You see how it's all lining up? Why is it that you get persecuted if, you don't, if you're not part of this system here? You go into the bank, you say, hey, I, I need to borrow some money. They say, we, live, we need to look at your credit report. You say, well, I own everything. Oh, do you have a credit card? No. Do you have a car payment? No. Oh, well, I'm sorry, sir. We can't lend you money. Wait a second. I have everything paid for. I own everything that is mine. I can prove that I have physical assets and I paid for them all with cash. I didn't get into debt to buy my things. And you're not willing to lend me money? The bank will say, no, sorry. Hmm. And by the way, just let me kick banking here while I'm at it. Banking today is what would be called fractional reserve banking. Okay? You take your money in. $120. You take $120 into the bank and you say, hello, Mr. Banker, or usually Mrs. Banker. <laughs> Another issue. You take it in there and you say, I'd like to deposit my $120. Right there you go. And they say, oh, thank you very much. Here's your little receipt. That, you know, Put the little thing through or whatever. Here's your receipt. Beep, there you go. Here's your receipt. Or maybe you don't even get a receipt. It just goes to your iPhone or whatever else if you're brainless. And here you go. And then they take it and they turn around. They do an about face and they go over to this big place here, this big vault, and they have the door open during the day and they go in and they take your $120 and they stick it in a box with your name on it and it's there until you need it again. No, I don't think so. They put it in, they entered it into the computer and now what do they do? Okay, the bank is closing, five o'clock. Okay, all right, hey, and they open. If, you could, if it was the truth, the bank would disappear and a casino would show up. And then they take your $120 and they say, uh, put it on black number six. You say, what's that? 
put it into this stock market, put it into this investment. So what about tomorrow? What if we lose big? Well, we'll just keep a little fraction of the reserve that we're supposed to have. We'll just keep enough there that in case Mr. Denlinger comes in and asks for his $120, we can give it to him. That's what they do. So I don't believe that. Okay, go to the bank sometime in the morning and ask for a couple thousand dollars in cash. I'm going to buy something on Craigslist or whatever else. I need a couple thousand dollars. Watch them sweat. They don't have it. They're spending it all the time. And see, they were supposed to keep more in there, but then they got rid of the uh, Glass-Steagall Act, which was passed after the First Great Depression because, notice I said First Great Depression too, by the way, because the second one's on the way, but it's going to be even worse. Um, but the Glass-Steagall Act was passed so that they had to keep more money in the bank, overthrown in the 1990s under Bill Clinton, so now they can spend all your money and just keep a little tiny bit in there for you to come in. See, there's a lot of things that happened back in the Great Depression, but the main thing that happened is what's called a run on the banks. People came in and they said, hey, the stock market just crashed. I want my $120. Okay, to get it out of the cash register. There you go, sir. Thank you. Next person comes up. Same thing he said, I want my $120. Oh, um, okay, here, here you go. Next person comes up. $120, same thing going on. Uh, um, well, all we have left is $20. Can you please take that? I want $120. We ran out of money. I'm sorry. What did you do with my money? I want my money. $20, sir. Sorry. The bank is now closed. We're no longer solvent. <laughs> we don't have your money, in other words, is a, a way that you say it there. Well, you put your money in the bank, it's not safe there. They're spending your money. <laughs> I mean, just crazy. Again, you study this stuff for yourself. I'm not lying. I'm not making this stuff up. It's, it's that bad. But let me show you another wealthy man in the Bible and show you something. Solomon mentioned it, but I'm going to show you another man here. Genesis chapter 13, Abram, called later Abraham. And we're going to see another thing that gives us a clue as to what true wealth is. Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with, with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Silver and gold money in the Bible? Sure. Silver and gold money throughout history? Absolutely. But notice the most important part there. Cattle. Physical assets. Something that you can eat. Hmm. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Good thing to do when you get in trouble, call on the name of the Lord especially for salvation. Verse 5, And Lot also which went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. Hmm. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. It wasn't just a little milk cow. Herds. Hmm. Verse 7, And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, and it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Okay. Um, let's see where I'm reading to here. Verse 12. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot pitched, or dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Problem there. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. 
Study the thing what happened there with Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodomites call today homosexuals. Whole other issue. But here's the point. Great cattle, substance, livestock, food. What did the Bible say earlier? First Timothy chapter 6, having food and raiment. Where did they get their raiment from, their clothing from? Uh, sheep, wool. There's all kinds of varieties of sheep, all kinds of varieties of wool. You can get some really interesting types of wool and things and, and stuff from different types of sheep, you know, cashmere and all this different stuff. It's really an interesting study. Um, and they had all that stuff. But what did they look for? Land. Um, do you have enough land that you can go and do things and, and whatever else and have livestock and, and whatever? Land is wealth. You say, no, 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 you know, numbers in a computer, you know, that's, that's wealth. Uh, no, that's artificial. Okay? But again, you're seeing the thing there of physical possessions. It's not, well, you know, Abram just got his money and whatever else, and he just gave it to somebody else, and they bet on it and whatever. No. Banking's not there. Be very careful about banking. If all of your wealth, if everything that you've earned and whatever else is in the stock market, retirement plans, savings accounts, the bank, you are gambling. You are gambling. Again, study any, history, any country that, that, that fell. Venezuela, uh, Argentina, another good example. Russia, um, back years ago. Uh, I think late 1990s or early 2000s, something like that. Study these countries, the Weimar, the Weimar Republic, Zimbabwe with their $100, $200 trillion bill or whatever the thing was. I showed it in one of my videos. Nephew gave me one. Study these countries. Banking is the problem. <laughs> okay? You say, well, well, what should I do? Get all my cash out of the bank? Well, it's better than having it in the bank, okay, first and foremost. But uh, cash is not worth anything, okay? Uh, you get right down to it. Let's just look at this again. As I stated, what's the difference? $100 bill, $20 bill, what's the difference? Well, the ink is slightly different colored, but it's the same paper. Now, all of a sudden, they say, uh, we were get to, you know, Donald Trump comes on TV and he says, um, my fellow Americans, Donald Trump, uh, he comes on TV and he says, my fellow Americans, I am sorry to announce that uh, our beloved country is falling apart. The Federal Reserve is no longer solvent. We have to, it's falling. Um, you have one week to come into the bank and deposit all your Federal Reserve notes and then they're not going to be worth anything. I'm sorry. I mean, they've been, they've been injecting billions and billions almost on a weekly basis. I mean, look at, the, look at the debt, how it's risen since Trump took office. And it's anybody that would have taken office, Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter. Hillary could be in there too and she, it'd be the same thing. Politics at the top is controlled by the Vatican. Whatever. But uh, this stuff here, all of a sudden the government declares these things are no longer legitimate. What good is it? Toilet paper? <laughs> oh, look at the pretty, you know, things. Maybe a collector will buy these someday and remember what America once was. Look at, you know, old treasury bills and things, Confederate bills from the Confederate states. Are they worth anything? If you like to collect antiques, perhaps, but they're not worth uh, what they once were. What about metal? You say, should I just go out and buy all quarters and pennies? Are these worth anything? Maybe something for scrap metal, but they're not worth anything in reality. Hmm. Um, what about cattle? What about land? What about things that you can actually use? Things that you can eat? Clothing that you can wear? Whatever else? You'd be better off investing in that stuff. Let's show you a couple other verses of Scripture here. James chapter 5. You say, I, I don't agree with you on this whole gold and silver thing, Brian. This is, this is sound investments. I mean, I've, I've been watching these guys, you know, and, and uh, was it Peter Schiff and, and um, Jim Rogers, and you get all these other guys, you know, in the financial sector and uh, monix.com and... and you know, all, I'm forgetting some of them right now, but all these guys, you know, you know, Kitco and 
you know, all these, they're all saying gold, you know, I've, I've seen economists, you know, guys that teach at university level and they're saying, I mean, I remember literally I saw one guy and he said, if gold had not been manipulated, it would be right around $60,000 an ounce right now. Okay. And he's probably right. I'm not denying that. But you see, the system that's coming is the mark of the beast. And they are manipulating the, the market. It's never going to go back up again. Okay, it might come up a little bit and whatever else. And but they're going to keep it down. And I'm going to show you the scripture that prophesies that. The book of James in your King James Bible, chapter 5, verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Rich men have miseries coming upon them? Why? Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Interesting, is what, what do moths eat? Wool. Hmm. What do rich businessmen wear? Wool suits. Rich preachers? Wool suits. Nothing to it. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. You say, wait a second. Gold and silver don't rust. Obviously, they didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, yes, they did. Because you see, you ever hear somebody say, I'm getting a little bit rusty? What's that mean? You're out of shape. You haven't been used in a while. Okay, that's what it's talking about here. It is not talking about uh, you yourself actually can get rust on you or something. No, no. Gold and silver here in the passage that the rust of them will be a testimony against you. What does that mean? They're not being used. You know why? Because they're not worth anything. They've created this satanic system here like this, and it's eventually going to go to, where did I put my marker at? The future of it is going to be the only way that they can bring about this, this fixing this whole global economy thing is very simply like this. Six, 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 cashless. I mean, again, how many people are even paying with cash anymore? Very few people. Most people are getting into digital currency. So you can create wealth artificially. Understand? It's not enough to print the money anymore. Now you just make it up on a computer. They're creating artificial wealth. Why? Because Satan wants to blind their mind. You say, well, not me. I'm stocking up on gold and silver. Who are you going to sell it to? I believe that gold is, is 60000 an ounce. Okay. $60,000 of what? Paper money? Going to go down to the coin shop? Hey, the stock market just crashed. Uh, here's a gold coin. Give me sixty thousand dollars. <laughs> uh, what are you going to do with it? Go to some other rich person and say, "Hey, I like that land that you have over there. I want to buy it with my gold coins." They're going to say, uh, "Yeah, look back in here. There's my safe with all the gold coins in it too. It's useless. It's worthless." Hmm. Hebrews chapter 10. See, lost people are trying to preserve their wealth. They're trying to say even, not just preserve it, they're trying to get out ahead of it. They say, they talk about the cycles, you know, and things, and, and you got to understand the, the cycles. When the economy goes up, you know, it's a, you know, I always get the two mixed up, bull market and a bear market, you know, all this other stuff. You, you, you learn to ride the cycles. So you sell when it's high and you buy when it's low. You know, you do all this thing and you can make out like a bandit, you know, and you get all this money and everything else. Um, and so you're putting your faith in riches. And eventually it's going to fall. It's going to fail. And you're going to come tumbling down. But here's for people that are saved that understand or that will be saved in the future. I'll say it that way. The book of Hebrews is written to a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 through 39. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great flight, or fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. All of a sudden, 
the economy collapses and everybody, everything falls apart in the time of Jacob's trouble and people just have to walk away from their wealth. They get out of there. I'm not going to be part of the system. I'm not going to buy into the system of debt so I can go 666 cashless. I'm getting away from it. Um, verse 34, For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. I'll show you that here in just a little bit. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. Second coming of Christ, in other words. And will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Somebody goes into this time of Jacob's trouble in the future when all this stuff falls apart and this system here is implemented. You're going to have to live by faith that the Bible is true. Okay? But if any man draw back, I can't take this stuff anymore. i got to go and i got to take that mark. I want to go back into debt again so I can have all this stuff here. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. God speaking. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Interesting, the Antichrist in that time that's coming is called the son of perdition. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Yeah. You have to look forward there in that time of Jacob's trouble. Matthew chapter 6 talks about an enduring you know, inheritance and things and, you know, the right kind of investment. Let's look about that right kind of investment. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break, break through and steal. It doesn't matter what you invest in down here. Somebody can steal it. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What did we read back there in the book of Proverbs earlier? Wisdom, understanding, knowledge from God, righteousness, doing the right things with your money, supporting God's work. You say, oh, you're going to make a plea for money. No, I'm not. I don't care about your money. Whatever. People want to support the ministry, fine. You get blessed by the sermons, fine. If you don't, Fine, whatever. I want you to understand eternal things. Quit looking at the stuff down here on this earth. It's all going to perish. It's falling apart right now as we speak. You know that if you have any intelligence at all. Okay, Lay up treasures in heaven. Nobody can steal them there. Gold and silver is not a safe haven. Okay, Taking your cash out and hiding in a little shoebox someplace, that's not a safe haven. All right, definitely not. You say, well, living out in the middle of nowhere with cattle and everything else, it's not a safe haven either. Okay, when you get down to it, smarter, it's a much better thing to do, but it's not a safe haven. You got to put your faith in God and get a right relationship with Him. Call upon Him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Do you have any hope? You better. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Before this system comes in, the Bible teaches that the body of Christ is going to be leaving. Read Revelation chapter 5. 24 elders, great multitude of, of angels, well, 100 million and a few thousand above that. Angels, they're in heaven. And in the, in the resurrection, they are they neither marry nor are mar or given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Okay? As the angels of God there. And again, I've talked about this in other studies. Uh, many people call this the pre-trib rapture. It's not actually a biblical term. It's actually, it's not rapture, it's resurrection. 
the resurrection is going to happen. Not one mention of the resurrection in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21. You've got to get the difference there. There is no resurrection when Christ comes back at the second coming. The resurrection happens before that comes. And, you know, you're going to get some brainless person saying, no, the res first resurrection is not until Revelation 20. That's when all the parts of the resurrection have completed. There's multiple parts. Again, read Matthew 28. The Old Testament saints were resurrected when Jesus came up. Okay, the resurrection, there's multiple parts to it. It isn't just in the future. Okay, <laughs> be doing a study on that in the future here. But the whole point is, what we're seeing here is that there's a comfort that we can know, hey, you know what? I'm laying up treasures in heaven right now, and I'm going to go to where those treasures are at the resurrection, and I'm never going to see this system right here. I don't have to worry about that. Christians are in heaven in Revelation 5. Revelation 6, the Antichrist is unleashed, the first seal. You can have that. Let's keep reading. Chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Okay? We understand. If you're saved, you're looking at the world and thinking, it can't be much longer. And you look at lost people and you say, they are clueless. They have no idea. Let's see about that. Verse 3, For when they shall say, notice the they, distinction between ye, you, yourselves, of verses 1 and 2. Verse 3, For when they, the lost world, shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. They're not escaping, but we, the body of Christ, are. You say, John Nelson Darby, John Nelson Darby, 1830, all this stuff, I have preached for years on this issue of the resurrection. People call it the rapture. I've preached for years and years and years. Nobody can answer my stuff. It's what the Bible teaches. Okay, The body of Christ goes up before God's judgment comes down. God is a God of justice. He does not judge His bride. Okay, The bride of Christ, the body of Christ. We are not judged by God. We leave beforehand. So you want your uh, economic stability and whatever else and things for the future? Make sure that you're saved. Get saved today. Make sure God saves you. Let me say it that way. Verse 4, But ye, brethren, switches back to saved, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, lost people, but let us watch and be sober. I look at the economy and the way things are going right now. I mean, it could fall, you know, the stock market could crash even before I get this thing uploaded. I look at the economy and I'm looking and saying, okay, they're moving towards the mark of the beast. That's where this thing's going. Okay? But others don't get it. Verse 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. A bunch of people are asleep. And those that aren't asleep are drunken. They're not getting it. They're staying in debt. They're staying in the system and looking for something better. And the devil's going to give it to them. Hey, you're in debt. You got all kinds of stuff. Do you want to lose it? No. Here you go. The new cashless system comes in. Christ brought it back. Antichrist. And he brought this thing in. And we can have all countries can have the same cashless system. Just take a microchip in your hand or in your forehead. Take the mark of allegiance to show your allegiance to the Trinity, the Holy Trinity that's over here in Jerusalem now, Christ and everything, you know. That's all you got to do. In fact, we could even give you credit. We'll even give you some money. Put it in your new account. So you can buy more things. You get it? We all suffered with this economic collapse. But we can bring in the new system here and you can, can forget about all your problems and you can buy yourself something nice. Buy your wife that diamond necklace that she's always wanted. Only diamonds are forever. <laughs> no. Continue. Verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what this system is? This whole system here brings God's wrath. 
you heavily invested in this, then God's wrath is on you. Whatever is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Verse 10, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ here, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also ye do. If you're saved, I have some good news for you. No matter what happens to you as this system, this economy collapses, you might die of starvation or you might die of something, worst case scenario, riots, looting, whatever else. You, you die, you go home to be with the Lord. Done, done things for the Lord and whatever else. Okay, you've laid treasures up in heaven. Nobody went up there and stole them from you. You might get home from work sometime and door was kicked in and all your stuff's gone. All your valuables are gone, whatever else. You order something online and whatever else and the box is there on your front steps and some package thief comes and steals it. Whatever. You bought a bunch of gold and silver back when silver was 40 something dollars an ounce and gold was fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars an ounce or something and now you're looking and you're thinking, ugh, this stuff's not worth anything. And it doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon, even though the, the economist guys are continually saying it's going to. Um, put your money where you're, you, it should be, you know, spiritually. Get that wisdom and understanding and knowledge. Well, you say, ah, not for me. I believe in the system. I believe things are going to work out just fine. Okay, I'm going to show you your, your future. Back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 24. You want to talk about prophet of gloom and doom and whatever else? Let me show you the future of this world. If you're heavily invested in this system here and you believe in what's coming here, here's your future. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest. As with the servant, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. Hmm. As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. You're a Wall Street banker. Time of Jacob's trouble, you're going to be on the street just the same as the guy that you used to rob. No longer rich ruling over the poor. Everybody's destroyed. Why? Because this system's not going to work very long. See, again, just understanding basic you know, economics, they bring in some kind of a cashless system that's worldwide that's based on just digital currency and whatever else. You can't have money last very long without gold and silver backing because you can't just keep printing into the moon. You, you keep printing money and money and money and money, it leads to hyperinflation. You say, well, if we can get all the countries to agree on this thing, it's still not going to last very long. That's why the time of Jacob's trouble lasts for seven years and fails. And it's not even a full seven years of the thing going good. It's only a few years. The thing's going to fail and it's all going to be people of all different walks of life, rich and poor, free and bond, the whole deal. They're all going to be on the same level. They're all going to be struggling. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled for the word, for the Lord hath spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away, the world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. You know what debtors are? These people that have all the debt. You see them driving down the road in their big $60,000 truck. You know, they got the sunglasses on and I'm cool to get out. Oh, I got a call on my phone. Yeah, hey, man, I'm at the gas station. They're haughty. Do they think about God? No. Do they care about his creation? No. They're going to be ruined. I don't want to take heed to any of this stuff. I don't want to listen to you. I got plans for the future, man. I think it's going to, I think it's going to work out. We're in the strongest economy ever. <laughs> you know, 2009, I remember Obama. This was the summer of recovery. No, it wasn't. You know, we're seeing, we're seeing really good employment numbers and everything else. Yeah, because their people are working at little low-paying jobs and sometimes working two or three jobs to make ends meet. Things aren't getting better. Okay? <laughs> the haughty people are going to be uh, brought down. 
They're going to languish. They're going to be suffering, in other words. Verse 5, the earth, the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. The new wine mourneth, the vine languisheth, all the merry-hearted do sigh. The mirth of tabrets ceaseth, the noise of them that rejoice uh, endeth. The joy of the harp ceaseth. They shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up that no man may come in. There is a crying for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone. And the city is left desolation and the gate is smitten with destruction. And you study the time of Jacob's trouble, what all happens. And it's pretty much that. What we just read there in Isaiah chapter 24. Um, if your hope is in the economic future, if you're storing all this gold and silver and saying there's going to be a transfer of wealth, everything is going to get better for me, the economy is going to tank, the bubble is going to burst, the, the uh, subprime mortgage bubble is going to burst, and we're going to have, I'm going to have so much money because my gold is going to go from 1,200 an ounce to, to at least 10,000, maybe 2,000, three, probably 10,000 an ounce. And so I'm going to have, oh, I'm just going to be wealthy. I'm going to have all this money. I mean, they're manipulating the market right now, and they have been for years with gold and silver. But in the future, it's going to change. You're foolish. You're foolish. You say, well... I've moved off grid and I have I am self-sustaining and all this other stuff. Okay, that's good. That's good. I support that. Okay, um, that's a smart thing to do. Uh, have real physical wealth, real physical assets, things that you can go and do and eat and whatever else, and you can take care of yourself. I'm all for that. But if that's all you have and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it's going to fall apart for you too. Um, my belief, what I did is I looked and I looked at this world and a long time ago and I said, you know what? It's pointless. Saving, just going out and breaking my neck to get this useless paper. Cares of the world there. Let me get this job that's, I'm going I'm to work harder and harder and harder and harder to get the best job so I can get more monthly bills. Let me go to college so I can get a good job so I can have more monthly bills. That's brilliant. And then I can get in the deceitfulness of riches. It would take me years to get $200,000, but if I have a good job and can prove that I have lots of monthly bills so I have good credit, then I can get, I can get more fake money, more credit, and more debt. And then I can get the lusts of other things coming in. And if the economy collapses, which it... They always do. They always have throughout all history. I mean, no nation's ever been in the kind of debt that America's in right now, but, you know, just kind of forget that. I think China's actually ahead of us right now, but if, if something fails here, they'll come up with something new. Desolation. Destruction is coming. And when you realize that, you say, uh, God? <laughs> uh, God? God, can you please help me? Things aren't looking so good. And you hear about the truth that when you get saved, God might not spare you from all the bad things that the world does, but God will spare you from His judgment. We're not appointed unto His wrath. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we read that earlier. I'm not appointed to God's wrath. See, God's going to judge the world with this system right here. But you don't have to go through it. I'm not going to. I know that the day is going to come when the Lord says, okay, you might see some bad stuff with the economy collapsing and things like people did in the first Great Depression, but you know what? When my system, when I put this whole system to an end, essentially up here, this current thing with the fractional reserve banking and all the stuff we have, and the Lord allows this thing to be brought in, the body of Christ is gone before it shows up. 
No Christian even has to worry about taking the mark of the beast because they're going to be up in heaven before it comes. You say, well, that's a lie. I've preached so many years on this stuff. You're a child, okay? If you think that the quote-unquote preacher of rapture is not true and whatever else, you are a child in understanding. Let me just tell you flat out, I've preached for years on it. I bring out videos offering challenges to post-tribbers. They can't answer it, okay? And I've never once quoted from Darby or C.I. Schofield or any of the others. Me and the Bible and the Lord showing me these things, and I show them to other people. Yes, there is a time when the body of Christ, the Lord's going to say, okay, come up hither, and He's going to take you up where your treasure should be and where nobody's going to mess with it. You can get in on that. Why? Body of Christ is still here on the earth. We haven't left yet. There are still those that hold to the King James Bible. There are still those of us that are saved, born again. You know, the Lord is, the Lord is really holding off judgment right now in this country, and it's because He's keeping the door open just a little bit longer. And the door is Jesus Christ, by the way. See Revelation chapter 4 if you want proof of that. And uh, John chapter 10, I think it is, where He says, I am the door. Okay, um, again, you can watch my rapture studies, preacher rapture stuff. Properly, it's actually the resurrection, the catching up of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. But the Lord is keeping the door open. All right, you still have time to get out of what's coming right here. And now let me just give you some practical advice here in closing. Um, for those of you out there that are saved, you know you're going to be caught up time of Jacob's trouble and whatever else, you say, well, what should we do about our money situation, brother? We're seeing things are happening and it's not looking so good. Yeah, it's not. It's looking pretty bad. Okay, if I could be zapped back in time 100 years ago and say to the people back then, um, the stock market's going to crash and it's, you're going to enter a time called the Great Depression. Okay, your gold's going to be taken away from you by Franklin Delano Roosevelt and then silver by, uh, uh, what was the guy? Can't think of his name right now. <laughs> My brain is, um, I cannot think of his name, the vice president of John F. Kennedy, uh, Johnson, okay. And then under Reagan, the copper went away. So, yeah, good. Um, <laughs> but if I could tell the people back then, what advice would I have given them to prepare for that stock market crash and Great Depression? Well, I would have said, don't have money in the bank, okay. Um, you be your own bank. I know that there's some some guys out there, some of the economist guys that I've I've watched and whatever else. Uh, Jeremiah Babe is one of them. Again, I, I'm not just totally recommending these guys and whatever else. I'm just saying they know what's going on with a lot of things. And he, one of his statements that I really hold to is, "Be your own bank. You be your own bank. Don't think I got money in savings and I got money in all this stuff and it's going to be fine." Mm, no, I would get your money as much as you can out of the bank. And I realize that you might need some in there for paying bills or whatever else, some in your checking account, whatever else. But I'd get most of that money out of the bank. Okay. You say, well, then I should just stockpile cash. Well, that's risky because you see cash is really, you know, just inflated. It's, it's not real. Again, what's the difference between the two? It's just what they say. It's not real money. So this can be devalued. Again, study the Weimar Republic. They're, they're taking stacks of cash in and trying to buy a loaf of bread with it. Okay, um, <clears throat> Cash is, is inflated right now. Uh, again, you're going to have to do some of your own study on this stuff. Um, you say, well, then we should invest in gold and silver. Well, some, perhaps. <laughs> I've done that in the past and things and, and whatever. There is some wisdom to that. And I mean, silver, hey, you can put it in a, a thing of you're storing water or whatever else, and the silver will actually kill the bacteria in there. So silver does have a good purpose to it. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, some gold and silver, perhaps. Uh, you say, should we get into foreign investments? The money thing is very, very volatile, okay? If you're in the stock market for any reason, get out of that thing as soon as you can. Um, if you have a lot of money put in retirement, whatever else, it can be wiped out like that. I'd be real careful of that. Um, do you have something that you can eat if everything falls apart? You say, well, then we should buy MREs. Please do not. We should buy Jim Baker you know, food buckets. 
<laughs> please don't do that, okay? Um, dehydrated foods, uh, prepper type of stuff, whatever else, avoid it like the plague. Um, if you have food that can last for years and it's, you know, vegetable, fruit, meat type of stuff, and it has, you know, a shelf life of years, they've had to put a lot of toxic chemicals into that stuff that it can last that long, okay? <laughs> there are certain things like beans, pasta, rice, um, grains that, yes, they can last a long time. Dehydrated fruits and vegetables can also last for a long time, okay? Uh, that stuff is there. Again, you can do this stuff yourself. You can go to the grocery store, you can buy fruits, vegetables, whatever else, get a cheap dehydrator and dehydrate your own stuff. Make sure that you have food, okay? You can rehydrate it when that time comes, put some water with it, whatever else, okay? Um, but what's better is having a yearly pantry. In other words, food that you can find in the wild, forage for, that you can grow or that you can raise, okay? Um, again, Another book, I talked about this in another video, but this book here, the Foxfire books, okay? There were people back in the Great Depression years that lived out in the hills and they didn't have two nickels to, to rub together, but yet they never went hungry. Why? They could hunt for food, they were growing food, raising food, they knew how to preserve food for the winter time, they, they knew all that stuff. And we have been robbed of those things. Okay, most of us have to go to the grocery store for all of our food. You're poor if you're doing that, okay? And I include myself in that number. Most, there's some food that we'll get with foraging and hunting and whatever else, but a lot of my food right now, our family's food is coming from the grocery store, unfortunately. Um, we have, you know, the learning curve there. It, you gotta learn this stuff. You gotta get out there and you gotta learn to get your own food, okay? Again, a lot of them people, I mean, I've read, I've read stories of people back in the Great Depression years, they didn't even know it happened until a month or two later when they went into town for whatever purpose. Uh, you're rich. If you can live in an off-grid situation and you have food and everything that is taken care of, and I'm not talking about prepping, I'm talking about living out there, not some kind of survivalist compound that you can go to when you got all this stuff stored up or whatever else. That stuff can be taken from you. You need to be able to learn how to get food from off the land, okay? Trust in God. Again, but if you're in a bad situation, if you're downtown some city somewhere, and you see what's coming, you say, well, Lord's going to take me out of here. The Lord's going to catch us up. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. Get some common sense there, okay? Um, we, as a family, almost fell into the system right here getting a mortgage. And the Lord said no to that. And we tried. We looked into it and everything else and found some, some bare land, nothing on it and no electricity or whatever else and put an offer in and boom, we got it. And I am thankful that we did because it's paid for. Not worth a whole lot of money, but you know what? It's worth a lot to us because of the clean air and because of the food that we can get off of our own land here and the, the, just the beauty of being out in God's creation and the low stress environment and everything else. I'm very happy to be here. Things fall apart. We're going to be very happy to be here. <laughs> okay. And you, I mean, read the Bible, wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, disease, all this other stuff, all this talk of coronavirus and they're going to forcibly vaccinate and they're going to this and they're going to that. You see, look at these things. You say, oh, I, I can't get out of where I'm at. I can't do this and I can't do that. Okay, store up your treasures in heaven. <laughs> Make sure that you're supporting good ministries if you're not in ministry yourself. Um, and I don't just mean money there. I'm saying, you know, pray. Put some, put some uh, time in to pray for good preachers, good ministries. I covet your prayers. I'd rather have prayer than money any day of the week. Any day of the week. Um, times are getting rough. Spiritual attacks are just ferocious sometimes. I need the prayers of God's people more than I need any kind of money. Please pray for us. Um, that's very, very important. But don't give your money to, to stupid ministries that use new versions of the Bible and that have church buildings with big mortgages to pay off. 
Please don't do that. That's a waste of money. You're not laying up treasures in heaven. You're wasting money. But um, there's a lot of different things that you can do. Again, if you're a young person, one of the best investments that you can make, books, paper books. Did you hear me? I said paper books. Don't get your e-books and all this other stuff. This thing works if the power goes out. Um, it works while you're going someplace. You don't lose reception and you can't get the, you know, I'm only getting four bars or I only got two bars here and, and my online ebook doesn't work. <laughs> no, I, I can't get into the website to look at the PDF file. It works all the time. You can put bookmarks in it so that you remember where you were reading. You can highlight it. And then you put it on your shelf when you're done so that in the future you say, oh, that's right. I, they had a thing in there about making how to build a log cabin. Let me see how to build that log cabin. And, and yeah, there it is. You see? Get some good self-reliant books. Learn, how, learn some skills. Learn how to make things. Learn how to go out and pick wild berries. Learn how to fish. Learn how to hunt. Get a little garden space. Take some of that money out of the bank and put it into things like dried beans or noodles or grains or things like that, things that don't perish. Okay? Water purifying. I mean, I know Peter Ruckman had a study years and years ago called the coming stock market crash, and he was giving a lot of this advice and whatever else. Um, it's something you need to think about. Okay? There's a lot in the scriptures. It's not just all spiritual things and just, you know, Oh, God will take care of everything. God gives you common sense, too. Okay? There are some things that are carnal, as the Bible says. And I don't mean sinful. I mean things that you have to take, take care of and whatever else. If you're a man, you have to provide for your own. That's very important. Um, another one that I have to mention, do you have a means of protection? Can you protect your loved ones? You say, well, I'm in the UK. I can't have a gun. Um... Okay, can you have other means of protection? Are you going to get your family out of harm's way? Or are you going to live downtown in the city where it's going to get real dangerous? Well, the police are always going to be there. Not if things really fall apart, like they've done in the past, many, many times, throughout different civilizations and different times. And you read about in the Bible, the people are calling for peace and safety. I don't believe it's because they have it. They're wanting peace and safety because everything's falling apart and they shall not escape, which would imply that the bad times are going to come and at that point in time when they're calling for peace and safety, we leave and then the Antichrist shows up. The Antichrist can't show up, by the way, until the body of Christ is gone. Anybody that preaches differently, anybody that preaches differently is lying to you. Christians are in heaven in, in Revelation 5. Antichrist is unleashed in Revelation chapter 6. Anybody that preaches that Christians see the Antichrist is a liar and a deceiver, and I don't care who they are or who they were connected to. Cross them off. Don't give them a cent of your money or your time. Okay? Very important. But there are a lot of things that you can do to prepare for rough times ahead. Again, if you're a young person, what if you have to leave the city where you're at? Are you prepared for that? Maybe it'll be just on foot. Backpack and enough gear and things in that backpack that you can go out and camp in the woods. Or you can just be in the city and, and you know, have everything go to pieces and whatever else and stuff. I'm trying to warn you. It's not going to get any better. So... Um, That'll be it for the study. Kind of a long one, but it's more of a, a very, very serious topic. Um, I've preached a couple sermons before this. Um, I'm probably going to be releasing this one first, though, because just the volatility of the, of the economy right now. Um, you would do well to spend your money on physical assets, things that will survive in the future. Okay, Don't worry about uh, you know learning the different cycles and whatever else so that you can come out and have the transfer of wealth be transferred into your lap and whatever. Make sure that you have food and raiment for the future. Make sure that you're going to be able to help other people, those that are worth it. And by the way, let me just say this. 
okay, you, you get out and you have your place and whatever else and you, and, you know, you have good food and whatever, you know, should you help people that have not um, taken heed to the warnings out there? Well, that's something you're going to have to pray about. Um, you can just say, no, absolutely not. They're zombie hordes. Just let them die. You can do that or you can say, yeah, I'll help everybody. But neither one is really smart. Okay. It's going to have to be on a case by case basis. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through all the different cases, what could happen and how this could be. In it. You're just going to have to pray about that stuff. But you're going to have to be real careful with that. Um, there's going to have to be, there's going to be some rough times ahead. Okay. <laughs> and I just need to warn you about that. So please pray fervently. If you're lost and you made it the whole way through this thing, understand that uh, things are going to get real bad um, and the body of Christ is going to leave and you're going to want to leave with them because if you miss it, if you miss the resurrection of the body of Christ, sometimes called the rapture, and you go into this system right here, it is going to be a nightmare. And all these debtors that are out there, all these haughty, wicked people that think that they're rich, fallen for the deceitfulness of riches, that are blinded by Satan, they're going to go right into this time here. They're going to take that mark of the beast right there, and they are going to be damned to hell forever. No, well, okay, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have... Uh-uh. This is the only thing in the Bible that once you do it, the first time you do it, you cannot say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, God, please forgive me. Wait, I did, that, I, I did something wrong. No, because when you take that mark of the beast, I believe, when you have that chip, it removes your free will and you will do whatever the Antichrist tells you to do. The Bible says the time will come in the day that kill you will think that they do God's service. And God at that point in time that they're thinking that they're doing ser service to is the Antichrist. This time period here is going to be a nightmare. Right there, you can get out of it. Again, watch my studies on the, the pre-trib rapture series and whatever else. I've preached over 100 sermons on that issue. Answered every single objection from the posties, every single one of them. Nobody's been able to answer my stuff. So please take the time to study the Bible. Please take the time to take heed to these things. Get your money out of the stock market as quickly as you can. If you are in some kind of a indentured slave type of thing, you're in some kind of a debt prison, get out of it by whatever means necessary. If you're a student, drop out of college instantly. Get away from the thing, okay? Um, you have some kind of mortgaged home or whatever else, see what you can do to get out of that. Some kind of vehicle that's, that's vehicle payments and everything else, and you, you got to get out of that stuff. Take drastic action now before things really fall apart. I pray you take heed to these things. Thank you for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17-18. through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.